go home. Um, hi, my name is Ray Cromwell, and I'm CTO of um, Timefire Incorporated. Um, now, before we get into the session, I just want to remind everybody that um, all of the sessions are going to be posted, excluding the Fireside Chats, on the Google I.O. website next week, mid-next week. And um, also, remember to fill out your evaluation forms that you find on your seats and put them in the bin on your way out to the back. So, this presentation is called GWT Extreme. Why did I call it that? What's the, well, actually, I, um, I didn't have any other name for it. I just thought it sounded kind of cool. But what I really wanted to show you today is um, when people come, first come to GWT, they kind of think of GWT as like sort of like this widget library, like ext.js or like Dojo. And it's, it just happens to allow you to write things in Java. But it's really just sort of about making, um, you know, fancy looking websites with widgets. But the reality is, is actually that's not really what GWT is. The widget library is really just a tiny part of it. Um, there's, you know, hosted mode, that's a big part of it. But for me, the biggest part of it is the compiler. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that during this presentation. Um, I think Bruce Johnson has beaten everybody over the head with the compiler for these last two days. I'm going to beat you over the head a little bit more. Um, However, what I'd like to do today to show in this presentation is to show you some what I think are neat, maybe remarkable things that you can do with GWT that have nothing to do with using the widget library. And this is sort of the agenda that um, I'm hoping to address. Um, first, I'm going to show you what faster and smaller than possible code really means. Now, Bruce has kind of told you what that means sort of by walking you through the compiler and, and talking about it as a high level. I'm actually going to choose some real-world examples to sort of hammer it home and show you uh, what the compiler can really do on real-world code. And I'm going to show you that by giving you two examples. One is um, parsing and evaluating CSS selector queries, and the other one is um, high-performance graphics. Then after that, I'm going to transition to showing you how to bridge GWT with other environments, like how to make remote procedure calls from inside GWT down to the Android native platform, like accessing the GPS coordinates that you're you know, currently at. How to basically compile GWT into Flash. How to produce a Flash SWF from Java code. And uh, hopefully, if there's time, actually how to write Gears workers in Java instead of having to use JavaScript. And I'll show you how some tricks for doing that. So what's faster and smaller than possible code mean? By the way, I added the end smaller. Bruce usually says faster than possible. Does this really mean that the compiler produces code that is faster than you could possibly write by hand? Um, it actually doesn't mean that. I mean, that obviously is untrue. I mean, if you're a real JavaScript ninja, you could write code that's probably as good as the GWT compiler. The, the actual um, meaning of this is, you know, in a normal course of a day's productivity, would you actually write code that was that tight and compact? It would consume way too much of your time to actually write hand-tuned, optimized JavaScript like that. Um, there's, there's a couple of reasons why I, we can do faster than possible code. The compiler actually has a lot to do with it, but what I'm going to talk about today is using generators to do it. And also, smaller than possible. The compiler aggressively prunes and eliminates anything not used. Um, any method that's not called is basically eliminated. Any field that's not read from is eliminated, and so on. It also aggressively op obfuscates the code, and it actually obfuscates it in a way that enhances gzip compression. So that's kind of a, another interesting thing. So the way I'm going to demonstrate this is with a new library I've written called GWT Query. How many people in the room have heard of jQuery before? How many people have used it? So um, for the people who haven't used it, jQuery is a library that allows you to sort of um, query the DOM, because everyone knows that navigating the DOM is very painful if you have to use the normal um, navigation methods like, you know, uh, next child, next sibling, and first child, and so on. Um, and it allows you to basically run a query, and then on the results of that query, you can actually um, do a whole bunch of things. Set CSS, perform animations, add um, event handlers, and so on. So what I've done is I've actually ported this to Java. And you can pretty much do the same thing you can do in jQuery. The actual syntax is very succinct. It looks very much like the original JavaScript by using some tricky Java 1.5 features. And it runs as bad as fast as jQuery uh, when it comes to 
um, dynamically evaluating the selectors at runtime. But what it can do that jQuery and no other JavaScript library can do is it can actually compile CSS selectors at compile time. So therefore, when you're loading your app up and you're running these selectors, there's no parsing overhead step. And it can leverage modern browser, fe browser features when available. So for example, it can transform a CSS query into XPath if your browser supports XPath, like every browser does except for you know which. <laughs> uh, and some browsers, like Safari 3.1, support a new W3C, uh, W3C CSS selector API where the browser can just natively execute the query on your behalf. And uh, there's also this other method called get elements by class name that takes advantage of it if it's present. So here's an example of what some what query code looks like. You have the jQuery like dollar sign function. Then inside of there is a, a little bit of a CSS selector. It says ul.menu greater than li colon first child. And what that says is find all the ul elements in the current DOM rooted at the document that have a class attribute equal to menu. Then find their first li element child. And set the inner HTML of all of those that you find to the word hello. So you might be wondering, what does this dollar sign function do? Well, on Safari 3.1, it resolves to a single line of code, which is document.querySelectorAll. That's that native uh, W3C API acceleration I was talking about. And that's done via deferred binding. But on other browsers, um, except for IE, it evaluates to a bunch of regular expression parsing of the selector which uses that to translate it to an XPath expression. And then it passes that XPath expression to the document.evaluate function that every browser, except for you know who, supports. <laughs> and then on IE less than eight and other browsers, it actually um, defaults to a bunch of regular expression calls to parse the query, and then perform a bunch of regular old DOM navigation calls, get elements by tag name, and you know, first child, last, you know, next sibling, and so on, until it you know, finds all the results. Note that each browser actually gets a separately compiled version of this. So for instance, the Safari version doesn't have any of this parsing or regular expression crap. And the Firefox Opera and older Safari versions don't have any of the stuff that the IE version has. Um, I did have a slide in here uh, uh, to kind of, kind of explain what generators are. How many people actually went to Bruce's generator talk? So if, if you don't know what generators are, it's really simple. There's a method in WIT called gwt.create. And what you pass to it is a, a class type or an interface type. And WIT has the capability of mapping that to a class that you write that can actually emit new Java code on the fly. And then it will compile that new class that you just emitted to a file on a disk. And it turns it basically into something that looks like new generated type. So this essentially allows us to basically synthesize Java classes on the fly. Um, if, if you've done it in traditional Java, you're probably familiar with like the ASM library or the bytecode engineering library. It's similar to that kind of stuff during the class loading phase, but this is done at compile time. So here is actually an example. Oh, let me talk about compile time parsing. If you look at most jQuery apps that use selectors, the vast majority of the selector strings are known at compile time. They're literal strings. Very rarely do people concatenate up a bunch of these selectors dynamically. So if they're usually static strings that are known when you're running your app, why parse these at runtime at all? It's a total waste. We could actually perform this parsing when you compile your app and just translate it into a static XPath string with no overhead. All you have to do is execute the XPath string using a browser's native method, and that's all you have to do. So here's an example how you use WIT query compile time selectors. There's a tagging interface called selectors. Um, if you've done any work with GWT image bundles or IE10N interfaces, this is very, very similar. You create a new interface of your own. Here I call it my selectors, and I extend the selectors tagging interface. And then I write a method that I want GWT to fill in the details for. Here I'm calling my method all first menu items. And it's just an interface method, doesn't have an implementation. And I then put an annotation on it at sign selector, and I put that CSS selector that you saw previously on the runtime query. Then you invoke gwt.create and then your interface, myselectors.class. 
GWT will run the generator and return an implementation of that method. And it will return the most efficient one based on what browser you have, whether it can delegate to the um, CSS selectors API in Safari 3.1, whether it's XPath or something else. Um, so basically, this is, this is what kind of happens when you call GWT create. It triggers a generator. There's a different generator for each browser, one for DOM browsers like IE, one for XPath supporting browsers, one for uh, other browsers like Safari 3.1. And the generator creates an implementation of the My Selectors interface. And the way it does this is it simply steps over that interface. And, and for each method, if it has an at selector annotation, it will grab the CSS selector out of the annotation and translate it to whatever it needs to, like, say, a static XPath string, execute the XPath string, and basically, that's the method. And the compiler actually will inline this method most of the time. So there's not even a function call to evaluate this, except to document.evaluate. This is the bottom line. Something like ul greater than li colon first child simply becomes, in generated JavaScript, document.evaluate ul slash li bracket position equals 1. That's xpath. So you might be saying, how big is the output? Well, let me compare it to jQuery. jQuery 1.2.3 is 3,400 lines of JavaScript, 98 kilobytes unprocessed source, 15 kilobytes obfuscated in gzip. Now let's look at uh, quickquery. Now, I'm not knocking jQuery here, by the way. I think John Rezig is one of the best JavaScript programmers in existence. jQuery, I love the API. It rocks. But I want to show you what the GWT compiler do, can do in the extreme. 3,400 lines of JavaScript. I'm uh, sorry, of Java code. 116 kilobytes on disk. How big is it compiled after GWT? Would you think 15 kilobytes or larger? I think most people are going to say no, because I wouldn't be calling this presentation <laughs> faster and smaller than possible. How about 7 kilobytes or 50% reduction? Now, if I came to you, let's say you were writing code in C++, and I said, I'm going to sell you a C++ compiler that will make your executables 50% smaller. Would you buy it? I, I think I would. However, the GWT team can go one better. They can actually get it down to at least 3 kilobytes. That's a 5 to 1 reduction over the jQuery equivalent. However, that's actually not the real size. The example that you saw, the compile time selector I just showed you, the actual size, 712 bytes on disk. That's actually smaller than a single IP packet most of the time, and smaller than the HTTP headers used to fetch it. Now, try to wrap your head around this for a second. We started off with 116 kilobytes of Java. And the GWT compiler reduced it by a factor of 100. Why are you not using GWT? That's what I would say if, if I were looking at this slide. Now, some people are going to object to this. They're going to say, it's a trivial example. You have only one CSS selector. You're not doing much. A more reasonable example would exercise a larger part of the jQuery API and reduce the amount of stuff that you can prune. That's all true. I just wanted to show you that if if you take care in the way you write your code, how aggressive, how extreme the GWT compiler can do in terms of optimization. And if you've been around using GWT for a while since the 1.3, 1.4 days, a lot of people criticize GWT by using trivial examples. They said they'd write the one line of code, print hello world, and they'd compile it with GWT and go, oh my god, look how big it is. You know, GWT's terrible. So I think this actually demonstrates that it's not terrible, and in fact, it's about 100 times better than everything else, in my personal opinion. So I'm going to show you a more beefier example, this of progressive enhancement. Now, how many people are familiar with the concept of progressive enhancement? So there's another thing, another frequent criticism of DWT, which is DWT is about writing desktop metaphor applications. You basically don't even have any HTML. You have a HTML body tag, and then that's it the script. They can't be indexed by search engines um, because it's just all code. And it's true that you can write applications like that, but GWT does not preclude you from writing applications more in a style of progressive enhancement. And here, what we're seeing is basically um, something that kind of loosely represents two PowerPoint slides. I have two divs, and inside them I have two bulleted lists. And they have some CSS classes on them. And what I want to do is 
I want to basically apply some logic to that to enhance it to where I get some sort of like PowerPoint-like transition and slide rendering. So I'm going to show you a demo of this first before I explain it. Um, let's see, this one. Okay, so, so here's what it looks like after um, it, I've run my uh, quick query demo. It's showing the first one as a slide. It's kind of like a box. Now, I know this kind of looks crappy. I'm not a great graphic designer, but this is like the best I could do on short notice. But I'm going to click the mouse button, and you can see that you get some sort of cool bullet showing up, appearing, just like you could do with like um, normal um, presentation software. If I click it again, the next slide pops up, and we get that. Now, just to prove it to you, if I actually show you the source code to this, it's just HTML. So Gwit can do progressive enhancement. Let me go back to my presentation, and I'll do slide no. Okay. So here's a sort of look at how it was implemented. I've got a new interface called slide, which extends selectors. I'm using compile time selectors. I have two methods. One's called slide bullets context, and its selector is just li. I'm looking for li elements. And I have another one, which is all slides. It's going to find all the slides in the DOM. And its selector is div.slide. That's find all div tags that have a class of slide. Now, notice that the slide bullets context function actually takes a parameter here. One of the options when you do a compile time selector is you can make the um, function take a parameter. If you do, it uses that as the root context to begin the query search rather than using the document body, the top level or the document. So this is the code that I implemented to do that PowerPoint um, demo you just saw. This is all of it. The entire thing fits, fits in one slide. It's very jQuery-like. Um, I'm not going to actually go over it because it would take up too much time to go by line by line, but I'll put it online later so you can actually go through it and actually see how it works and how the GWT query API looks. Um, I want to show you an example of what the generators output. So if you go back and look at this interface here, it has um, a method called all slides and slide bullets context. The generator emits a Java file called slide native impl. This is for Safari 3.1, and it has a method on it called all slides. This is literally the code. Query selector all dot slide li. That's it. And the GWT compiler will actually inline this, and you end up with essentially like one line of code in, in the output. That's why we get so small. The XPath version for Firefox, Opera, and um, any other browser that supports XPath looks like this. Slide XPath impl extends selector um, engine. And what you see there is an XPath expression that's actually the translation at compile time of that um, of one of those early, the slides, uh, the slide li. So it's like, if you don't know XPath, this won't really make sense to you. But the key takeaway from this is that it was done statically at compile time. So at runtime, all it has to do is feed that string to the browser's native XPath execution engine. So I'm actually releasing GWT query today. Um, it's a very, very rough alpha, so I um, but warn you. But I, I'd encourage you to download it, play with it, Try it out. It's available at gwtquery.com. So, now to have to transition over to high performance graphics. This is an area kind of closer to my heart. Now, if you've done rendering in the browser before, you're probably familiar with there's, there's two different models for rendering in the browser. You can actually use the canvas tag or you can inject SVG or VML into the DOM. And those kind of loosely correspond to APIs in the, gra three, in the 3D graphics world um, that are either immediate mode or retained mode APIs. A immediate mode API is procedural, like OpenGL or DirectX. It's basically you, you have an object and you can say move, line to here, line to here, close it, stroke it, fill it, and so on. Right? It's very procedural step by step. Retain mode APIs are more object-oriented. It's more like um, add a circle and a path and um, a square and some other stuff into this scene graph, and uh, you figure out how to render them, what order to do it, and what actual low-level calls have to be made. Now, people who do games programming typically prefer immediate mode because you have more control. 
more capability to optimize, and it's generally faster. Retain mode has the benefit of convenience, but here's the problem. DOM operations in the browser are hideously slow. So if you need to draw, for instance, a thousand rectangles or a thousand lines, you have to shove a thousand DOM elements into the browser to make that happen, and I guarantee you that's going to be slow. However, for Canvas, there's also a problem. The JavaScript VMs I've tested usually top out at about 1,000 to 10,000 method invocations on the underlying Canvas object um, before frame rate suffers significantly. So the question is, can we do better? Can we render more by caching and using our work somehow? And the answer is we can if we borrow a page from the playbook of OpenGL, which is one of the preeminent uh, 3D graphics APIs. What we do is we introduce this abstraction called the display list. And what a display list does is it captures a sequence of your draw commands. So you can say, like, begin display list, um, move to here, uh, draw a line to here, draw a line to here, draw a line to here, stroke it, fill this area, uh, maybe scale it or something like that. And then you close the display list, and then you can replay it back a bunch of times. And if you're smart about the way you replay these display lists back, you can actually increase the performance of a bunch of procedural calls. One way to do this is you can collapse a sequence of um, transformations, coordinate transformations, like scaling, rotations, uh, translations, into a single set transform call. Those are usually actually pretty expensive because each one entails a matrix transformation, which is like an n cubed operation. So the more of those that you can remove and collapse, the faster your rendering is going to go. You can also call and call and clip some things if you can detect that they're sort of not visible or outside the, the browser window. And finally, sometimes, based on the state of the graphic pipeline, you can actually figure out if you can cache the whole thing as a bitmap and just stamp the bitmap down and like clone it around. So I'm going to actually demo this. So here's a demo. It's fairly boring. Uh, again, I'd fire my graphic artist for suckage, but I'm the graphic artist. <laughs> um, it's not very exciting, but I'm going to add a bunch of triangles. So, uh, sorry, rectangles. So we're up to about 96, 192, 384. You can see that the total Canvas calls are 4,200. That means it's calling like Canvas context dot, you know, move to, line to, and things like that 4,200 times. Now, if I increase this more, I told you it tops out at around 10,000, the frame rate's going to slow down. I'll do that. So you can see it slowed down a little bit. Now it's getting really slow. So let me go back. So you see up there, there's, a, there's an indicator that says display list off. I'm going to turn on display list now. OK, I'm going to turn on display list now. OK, there we go. And I'm going to start adding rectangles again. So remember before, we topped out at around 384. Now I'm going to add more and more and more and more and more and more. 49,000 rectangles. It's starting to slow down now, but you know what? It's still an interactive frame rate. In fact, you can actually get up to about 1.5 million rectangles per second. This is in the browser. And it's still one frame per second. Um, and a lot of this has to do with sort of the technique I've chosen of display list, but a lot of it has to do with just the raw efficiency of that GWT has in inlining all these this canvas calls. It basically, in GWT 1.4, it used to be that I had wrapped the canvas object with Disney methods, and every Disney method actually would actually be an extra function call to the low-level JavaScript. But with GWT 1.5 and the new overlay type and everything, it just gets inlined into one just big, long, you know, draw, you know, move to, line to, draw this, draw this, draw this. So it significantly reduced the overhead. So um, let's go back. Where am I? Okay, there we go. Thank you, Steve Dell. Okay, so that's an example of some extreme graphics performance. I want to do another demo. This is of a, um, a chart that I've written in GWT. Now, you might be saying, oh no, someone's written yet another JavaScript charting library. There's like gazillions out there, and some of them are quite good, time plot and plot kit and so on. Why would you bother to write another? Um, and I'm going to digress for a little bit, little bit and talk about why by just talking about what my company does. So what TimeFire does basically is we want to organize the world's scientific, numerical, quantitative data like Google organizes the world's information. And we want to provide you with 
essentially a telescope or a microscope. So you can just fly over history like Google Earth can fly over the globe and just look at any point in history and, you know, let's say look at crop yields in 13th century China, uh, compare it to the Green Revolution in the you know, 19th and 20th century, and maybe you'll figure out some things that have happened in history. So, but to do that, we needed to engineer a really, really high-performance chart. And I'm not talking about just rendering a few hundred data points here. I'm talking about rendering tens of thousands of data points at real-time speed. And here's another example of how good the GWT compiler is. The Chronoscope chart library is 20,000 lines of Java source, 500 kilobytes on disk, but it compiles to just a measly 58 kilobytes. And last year when I demoed this at the Voices That Matter conference, I could only render about 15,000 points at interactive rates. It turns out, simply recompiling with GWT 1.5, my performance has doubled. So that, to me, is a huge win for using GWT, because I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was just download the release candidate, recompile it, and poof, I've doubled my performance. Um, also, because I'm using Java to write this, I don't actually have to compile it to JavaScript. I could actually run it as an applet, or I could run it on the server to generate static PNG images or I could even run it inside the Android phone. So GWT actually allows you to move code around between environments as well. Um, and also basically allow you to um, use the chart API via Java. You can do it via JavaScript, or you can actually even do it with microformats and CSS, CSS and no um, coding at all. So let me show you a quick demo. So. So here's an example of the chart. This is 700 data points. Now, most other JavaScript charting libraries, they'll top out at, like, maybe 300, 200, and they, they can't render as smooth as this. I can, like, fly around this thing. It's very, very smooth. Um, and I can go bigger. Here's the chart. This one's actually got 18,000 data points in it. So. This is like interest rates for you know the last 40 years. Okay, I can zoom in here, I can zoom in more, I can zoom in more. It's see how, you can see how fast it animates. There's a lot of headroom actually. I can render a lot more than this. And just recently, because of the performance boost at 1.5, some of the core algorithms of this chart are, are O of log n. They use a lot of binary searches. And basically, GWT allowed me to double the exponent of the of the height of the search I'm doing. So actually, we can scale this up to one million data points in real time in the browser. This is actually every Google tick trade over the last couple months since January. There's about one trade per second. There's millions of data points here. And I can just zoom in real time and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, down to hours. Let me get there. Okay. Keep going, keep going, keep going. In fact, I can't, I cannot zoom in far enough to actually get below the level of detail. I can actually keep zooming in. I mean, I can do this all day long. Actually, there's still points. If I move this around, you can see there's still points every pixel. I go down, there's minutes. I can go down to seconds, and there's still data points there. So that's basically what GWT allowed me to do. It allowed me to write a chart that can actually scale to millions, and I think billions of data points. So Chronoscope actually is open source. So if you're interested in using it, um, you can actually go and download it um, on the web. We're going to be releasing an easy-to-use gadget soon so that if you don't want to program, you can just source script it into your page and use microformats, and you can just chart very easy. Um, I just wanted to mention some key insights that I got from porting this to 1.5. I had to make a couple of changes, but method inlining yielded up to 100% performance gains. I, this has been mentioned several times. In some of the core inner loops, or the rendering loops, the, the, the speed up was about 2x. The ability to inline Disney methods, huge, huge win on IE6. Okay, IE doesn't have a canvas. So the way we actually render on IE is we use Flash. We actually delegate to a Flash component in the page and use Flash to do the rendering. The issue is, is to actually send those draw commands to Flash, we have to concatenate a string of all the draw commands, like move here, draw here, and so on. 
String concatenation in IE stinks. I mean, it's terrible. So you want to avoid it. So the way we avoid it is we push strings into an array and then join the array at the very end. Now, I used to have these Disney methods that would actually push the draw command. So like the implementation of like the move to command would be a Disney method that would do array.push and like, you know, a little string that represents a move command. Inlining those, it actually was greater than a 2x increase, actually. I didn't really measure, but it was more than a 2x increase on IE6. There's a slight increase in size, actually, in GWT 1.5. So unlike the move from 1.3 to 1.4, sometimes there's an increase. It's very small. It's like 5%. I'd trade off the performance increase for that size increase any day. Um, GWT 1.5 actually introduced long data type um, emulation. So if you've actually, um, if you're aware of it, JavaScript actually does, only has one numeric data type, which is a double. And a double only has 53 bits of precision. So if you want to actually get a real long integer, 64-bit, you have to emulate it. And GWT actually introduced this emulation in 1.5. And for the most part, it's not going to hurt you. But if you happen to have some methods that are very much reliant, they're called a lot, like I do, because I'm actually processing date-time information, those longs hurt you. So actually, for example, I had to actually write a Disney function to return the time in milliseconds as a double because returning it as a long slowed me down big time. So you got to watch out for longs. Also, static initializers can be harmful. So you got to be careful about, um, you know, putting a static block on a class and doing a bunch of initialization there because, first of all, it tends to hamper pruning in the compiler because the compiler sometimes can't figure out that it can get rid of it. But due to the way that the Java language spec is um, written, you actually have to call those static initializers the first time you reference a class, and that actually um, adds some overhead into the generated JavaScript where it calls it even if it didn't need to because it's already been called once. So just be careful with static initializers. I would advocate using lazy initialization um, semantics on methods if you can. Um, getting, I'm kind of spending too much time there, so I'm going to move on. That's uh, chronoscope and high-performance graphics. Now, <clears throat> this is where it gets fun and it gets rather complicated. What about integrating GWT with other environments? What are some kind of ways that we could, you know, pair GWT with Android, for example? I've actually heard people ask that question before. Um, you know, what does it mean to combine GWT and Android? Well, what I'm going to show you now is how to integrate GWT with other container environments. Now, if you've done RPC programming, you're already familiar that GWT actually can integrate with the server very well. You use GWT RPC mechanism, and you can make procedure calls seamlessly between the client and the server. It's this very natural, it's all Java. You don't have to worry about, you know, XML, HTTP requests and what's going on. But, and also you can integrate with the browser using Disney. You can just make transparent calls to JavaScript by using Disney me method. However, wouldn't it be nice to be able to use an RPC model to make calls to native Android platform methods, like, you know, get the contacts list, make a phone call, get GPS data, but from within the browser, from within a, a, an actual browser application. And maybe it would be nice to make calls into the Flash VM, to actually write some Java code, compile it, send it over to a Flash VM for execution, and make procedure calls back and forth between Flash and the browser. And Google Gear has actually introduced this concept of the worker thread. And right now, today, you actually have to write these workers as hand-coded JavaScript. And if you're a GWT developer, that's kind of irritating. It's like, why do I have to drop down to JavaScript to write, like, these worker threads? Wouldn't it be nice to actually write those in Java? Here's the motivation for Android. This is something I came up with a couple months ago. I call it Syndroid. Now, today, when you write gadgets, they span many platforms. You know, if you write an iGoogle gadget, it's not the same as an OSX dashboard widget, which is not the same as a Yahoo widget uh, or Google desktop widget or any of the Flash widget startups, and it's not the same as an Android app. So, you know, if you're doing, like, a social widget, you know, God forbid, a vampire biting widget, but, um, <laughs> but if you're doing one of those, right, wouldn't it be nice to write it once and then just have it run on all of those places, right? Can we achieve that? I actually think we can, and I think GWT is core to achieving it. So what is Syndroid? It's a synthesis of Android and GWT. It's, it's a key enabling um, technology. It, you write gadgets to a restrictive API, restricted API, and then you can compile those gadgets to JavaScript, compile them to the Dalvik VM, 
or compile them in the action script. And then you can deploy them as a packaged Android APK file to an Android phone, deploy them to iGoogle, deploy them to your Mac desktop, or to Yahoo and any of the other gadget containers. And I'm just going to show you, before I get into how this works, I'm going to show you a quick demo. It's not a very impressive demo, um, but it just serves as an example nonetheless. So here's the Android emulator. And in the application uh, list, there's something here called Syndroid Demo. Now, when I bring this up, this is actually an HTML page that's loading up an Android with a GWT application in it. And what the GWT application is doing, it's not very clear what it's doing, but what it's doing is it's calling Java methods in the Android platform. It's calling from JavaScript to Java and asking the phone, where are we? What's your longitude and latitude? And it's also accessing the context. You can see there it says John Smith, Ray Cromwell. I can actually go and add another contact and, you know, if I go back, um, let's go contacts and uh, so let's see here. New contact, I'll just type in anything. Put in, you know, 555555555. And then um, go back there and then go back. I'm, I actually never have done this before, so I don't know if it's going to refresh. Uh, let's see if it does. Yeah, you can see it in there. It, it picked it up. So this is actually JavaScript running in the Android web browser that's actually accessing native Android Galvic VM methods. How do we do this? Well, we introduced something called the Android native interface. Think of it as like the JavaScript native interface, but for Android. Let's pretend for a moment that the Android team at Google actually exposed the location service as a top level JavaScript object, unlike the window object, like window.location service. And you could call a method on it called get location. Then it would be a no-brainer how to do this in GWT. You would just write a Disney method, you'd access window.location service and call get location. The problem is, is they didn't write that, expose that object on the window object. How do we do it and can we do it automatically so that you actually don't have to delve into uh, too many um, internals? Well, the way we're going to do it is we're going to combine two new features, well, one new feature of GWT 1.5 with an old feature of GWT. So we're going to combine generators plus linkers. So we're going to, like I said before, we're going to extend the RPC model and um, by defining a new RPC interface called the, an Android native interface. And it can be synchronous or asynchronous on Android. Um, generally, if you choose an asynchronous model, you get more flexibility because sometimes um, things might turn out to require being asynchronous. But I'm going to show you synchronous in this um, presentation. We use a generator to take that interface and go back and generate this stub for us with this Disney method. So the generator is going to take an interface and it's going to go back and generate this code and pretend that that location service object is there. Now we have to do something else to get that location service to exist and then we're going to use a linker to do that and I'll get that, get that in a second. Um, so we need to generate the server side of the request. That's the location service that's going to implement the get location function. That actually requires us to write some Android code. There's no way around that. Um, and this server code needs bootstrapping. See, what, normally with GWT, you have a bootstrap script. You load up your generated JavaScript, um, but it requires this selection script, which actually figures out which one to load up, and it has to do some bootstrapping. Well, Android is Java. It's not JavaScript. So we actually have to generate a bootstrap script that actually turns out to be a complete Android application to package the GWT app as an Android app. We're going to use a linker to do that and a linker to do the packaging and compiling. Here's an architectural diagram of how this is going to work. We have a tagging interface called Android Native Interface. We create a location service interface that extends that tagging interface. And we put a method on there we'd like to exist. String get location. We'd like for that method to exist. We use a generator to automatically generate this blue box location service client. And it's simply going to return window.locationService.getLocation. It's going to pretend that that function exists in the JavaScript VM. We're going to use a we're going to write this class called location service impl in Java. This is not GWT code. It's actually Android code. That's going to call a bunch of Android functions and get the GPS location and return it as a string. We have to write that. But we're going to write it in Java. Finally, a linker is going to generate a bootstrap application. And what it's going to do is it's going to use a little known feature of Android. Um, Android actually allows you to take Java objects 
and bind them into the WebKit JavaScript execution environment. So if you're writing Android apps, you can actually take any old Pojo you write and you can shove it into the WebKit and, and it, it's accessible from JavaScript. So we're going to use a linker to bind this implementation and um, expose it as window.location service. So here's an example of the location service API we'd like to exist. Public interface location service extends Android native interface. And we have our method there we'd like to exist, which is get location. However, we need to tell the generator a little bit of extra information. We need to say, first of all, what's the top level JavaScript variable that we want to expose this as? And I have an, an annotation here called at ANI binding, and I put in there location service. So that's going to become window at location service. Secondly, we have to say where is the implementation of this on the Android side that actually does the low level Android call. So it says you, you just simply add at implemented by location service impl. That actually tells the linker some crucial information it's going to need later. And here's an actual um, bit of code, which is the Android side. It's the location service impl. And you don't have to worry about how this works. You just notice the bolded green line, which returning a string, which is like latitude and longitude. And somehow it got that from the an Android platform. But that's the key. It's basically returning those coordinates. And this is how you would use it in GWT. When you write a GWT application that you're going to package on Android, you'd say location service gwit.create location service class. The generator runs, it creates the client side with that with the reference to window location service. The linker runs, it takes that implementation class you wrote and it binds it into the JavaScript VM of the browser on Android. And then here we simply call service.getlocation and we put up an alert window. So um, this is an example of the bootstrap that's generated by the linker. This is the actual code. And you can see I've highlighted a, a line here which says wv.addJavaScriptInterface new location service impl, comma, location service. And you can see where those came from. The first uh, one came from the at implemented by annotation. And the linker took that and shoved it there. And the second thing, which is what you're exposing it as to the JavaScript interpreter, came from the ANI binding implementation, uh, annotation. You also have to generate this thing called the, the, the Android manifest, which is this some extra metadata which tells the uh, you know, Android runtime like how to run the app and where things are located and so on. This is required, but it's, it's required boiler, boilerplate, but you, know, you don't need to understand it right now. And then you actually have to basically package the darn thing. And this actually took the longest amount of time for me to understand, believe it or not. Because you have to run like four or five steps to actually package something as Android from the command line. So I had to make some directories. You have to put some things in certain directories. You have to actually run this thing called the AAPT tool to convert the manifest file into a r.java file. You have to compile the implementation classes with Java C. Then you have to run the DX tool to convert the .class file bytecode to the DEX Dalvik VM bytecode. Then you have to basically um, package in the assets like the HTML and GIF and stuff. And then finally, you have to run zip and shove those converted classes that are in the DEX format back into the package. But in the end, you end up with this thing called uh, uh, SynjoyDemo.apk. And that's a deployable that you can just simply put on the phone, and the GWT application will run offline on the phone, like it was a native application. So um, how does a client sub generator work? It's kind of simple if you've seen generators before. Um, it basically um, it, it basically has to do two tricks that you may have not seen before. First, it has to use the implemented by annotation to find the Android implementing class. And it has to copy this class um, to the output for the linker. Because this class is an Android implementing class, it actually is not translated to JavaScript. It can't be. And if the GWT compiler tried to compile it, you would get an error. It's actually a, a, a class that's meant to run as Java. So we basically, the generator has to grab onto that and move it over into another directory where the linker can then run Java C and compile it and package it like I just showed you. It generates the client stub, which I showed you earlier, which is simply window.location.service.getLocation. It's a JSON method. The important thing, though, is the, link, the generator has to communicate something to the linker. See, generators work on the type system. You get, generators have access to something called a type oracle. So they can actually see everything about the source code, like what types, methods, return, and things like that, just like Java reflection. 
but they can't really see the build artifacts because those don't exist until the compiler is done processing all the generators and has compiled everything. Linkers, on the other hand, work on build artifacts, but they really can't explore the type system because they're meant to basically package things up. So you need to somehow, sometimes we need to communicate type information from the generator to the linker, and how, we do, how do we do that? Well, actually the way I do it is kind of naive and simple. Uh, Bob, if you went to see his linker presentation, he has a slicker way of doing it. But the way I do it is I actually just use a text file. I generate a text file in the linker and put whatever type Oracle information that I need, like what the implemented by class is and what the annotations are, and shove that into a text file. And then I pick it up in the linker by reading that text file. In our, and so in our case, I write out a mapping of the ANI binding, which in this case is location service, and the implemented implementing class, like how the JavaScript object maps to the native Java object that, that's on the Android platform. So, um, the linker step is very, very complicated. So I, I kind of went back and forth of actually trying to show this, how this works on the slide with code. And it's too, it's too complicated. I could do like a two-day session on it and probably not have enough time. However, um, I have a blog series called GWT 1.5, uh, The Path to 1.5. And in that blog series, I've been documenting my research on doing this. So if you go to my blog, which I'll show you at the end of the presentation, I'll actually post up the real code in detail with a tutorial exactly how everything works. But these are the steps that it has to do. It has to read that text file from the generator. It has to copy implementation classes to a build directory. It has to copy public resources like the HTML and GIFs and stuff into a special assets directory because Android wants all of the sort of HTML resources to be in a special directory. Then it has to generate that Android manifest boilerplate. It has to generate a um, Android bootstrap activity, which I showed you where you actually bind that Java object into the JavaScript VM. And then it has to run all those Android tools to pack it. So it's very complicated, but you go to my blog and you'll see the real code in like maybe a week. Future directions, right? Where else can this go? Well, you can imagine that we could actually use a special bootstrap script in GWT to detect whether you're visiting a website with a normal browser or with an Android browser. And if you're visiting with a normal browser, we'll send you down the GWT compiled JavaScript gadget. But if you're visiting with an Android browser, we could actually send you down an over-the-air provision and install an app into your phone so, and, ta and take the gadget offline. So that's what I'm looking at doing in the future. And this is like a link to my, blogs, my blog um, series, but I'll show you the actual real URL at the end of the presentation where it's a shorter URL. Now. How can we write flash code in GWT? I think a lot of people are maybe interested in doing this. We can actually use the same design pattern that I just showed you for Android to do this for flash. What we'll do is we'll define an action script native interface. It's still an RPC model. And we'll place all of the native flash code, the stuff that we only want to compile and run inside of um, the flash VM in a special like dot flash package. So typically, you know, with GWT, all of the code that is supposed to be compilable, you actually put it in like a dot client package. We're going to put all of the flash specific code into a dot flash package. It's just a convention. And we'll use a generator to copy everything that's in the flash directory in this, into um, some other directory. And there's a reason why we'll do that, and I'll show you in a second. But then we'll use a generator to create Disney methods, which invoke methods on the Flash plugin. If you're, if anyone, is anyone familiar how the uh, Flash external interface works? Right. Yeah. So Flash actually has this mechanism by which action script methods can be exported, and they appear on the plugin object, on the object tag, essentially in the DOM of the JavaScript of, uh, of the main browser. So we're actually going to basically generate client stubs. That Disney methods that invoke the equivalent of like plugin dot method, but that doesn't explain how do we turn Java code into a dot SWF file. So here's what we'd like to do: we'd like to say, I have an action script, whoops, action script native interface. It's a tagging interface. 
I'll make a new interface called draw service and have a method called draw line. The generator generates this draw service client. It's a Disney method. It calls window.flashplugin.drawline. How does that draw line function get attached to the flash plugin? Well, we'll see that in a second. You go and write something in a dot flash package that's the native implementation that actually uses Disney to call action script methods, like on the uh, sprite or movie clip objects. And then the linker is going to somehow generate a main method and export that method you wrote that's in that sort of green box there onto the plugin via the external interface. But this still doesn't explain how did this Java turn into an SWF file? Well, here's the idea. Invoke the GWT compiler recursively. This is a major hack. Okay, so I'm not advocating everyone do this, but it is a way to achieve this. Here's how you do it. You use a linker to create a new GWT project. So the linker actually will create a directory and copy all of the things that are in the flash package into that directory. And then it's going to emit a new module.gwt.xml file that's specifically for that source code that's in that directory. It's going to generate a module entry point. For each action script native interface in this entry point, it's going to add a, a, a call to the external interface method to export those methods th um, that you implemented in Flash. Then it's going to invoke the GWT compiler somehow to produce an SWF. But I still haven't explained how that's going to happen and emit SWF as an output artifact. Well, how do we do it? The GWT compiler produces JavaScript. It turns out it's actually relatively clean JavaScript. And if you avoid any GWT APIs that actually touch DOM methods, because the DOM only exists in the browser, JRE methods are generally safe, the code turns out that actually it will work with the Flex3 SDK compiler. It will actually look like ActionScript. It will compile cleanly in non-strict mode. So what we do is we use a linker to um, add a custom bootstra bootstrap script because Flash has some requirements on like how to invoke the main, what's the first thing it's called, and things like that. And we invoke the Flex3 SDK compiler on the JavaScript that came out of the GWT compiler. Then we emit the resulting SWF file from a linker as an output artifact. And then, if you're not quite aware what's happening yet, this is a recursive compile. So there's actually a parent compiler. So the parent compiler will p have another linker, which will pick up that SWF file, put it into the output directory of your GWT app, and then inject an object tag into your host page that will host that SWF file. I call this the generator plus linker plus generator plus linker pattern. <laughs> uh, I know it's a mouthful, but. Um, I'm going to write a blog post about this in the future and explain it in more detail. I'm not sure how production quality this is. I've actually mentioned to Bruce um, and the GWT team this concept of maybe creating zoned compilations where the GWT compiler can treat certain packages as, as separate um, zones to compile separate, um, boot, to have separate linkers attached to them and separate startup scripts. That actually would go a long way to sort of eliminating the recursive compile problem, but for right now, this actually works. Now, if you've been following me so far with this generator linker, generator linker pattern and the RPC model, then it's not very hard to, to imagine how this can be used to do um, gears workers. We can reuse the same pattern as Flash. We can place gears translatable code in a dot gears package. We have to use async RPC for, for uh, gears workers because it's an, it's an asynchronous message passing um, interface. And because the stuff doesn't get marshaled automatically like it does with Flash or Android. We actually have to marshal some of the more complex types as JSON objects back and forth between the JavaScript VM and the Gears uh, JavaScript VM. But we can use like an SSO-like linker to produce um, uh, a simple script that will run as a Gears worker. Um, and basically, we just do recursive compilation again. So we do the same thing we did with Flash, only the only step that's missing is the invoking of the Flex3 S3, uh, Flex SDK compiler. So, um, let's see, I think that is about it. GWT query, once again, is available at gwtquery.com. Chronoscope charts are available at timepedia.org. For in-depth articles, you can go see my blog at timepedia.blogspot.com. And there's going to be some updating uh, um, upcoming articles on the ActionScript native interface and Syndroid. That's it.
I think we have um, five minutes for questions. I think everybody's in a hurry to get out of here. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, so past call, I've been before I came to I/O, I was really interested in pursuing GWT. After this talk and all the other talks, I'm very, very interested in pursuing it. So I guess the biggest thing is, how long have you been working with GWT? Um, I'm guessing you were a Java developer before you started working with GWT, and the, the learning curve and experience that you've had and how to like migrate from server-side Java development to using GWT for both sides and, and doing more advanced things like, like you just showed. Okay. Um, I've, well, I've been a Java developer probably since like the alpha days of Java. It's like when Hotspot Java came out, uh, the, the browser or whatever. Um, but the interesting thing is actually I implemented the original Chronoscope chart in JavaScript. And um, I was having huge productivity problems, problems with doing testing and debugging. And I wanted the chart to actually be able to run on the server as well because a key component of um, returning our time series search results was actually to show you an icon. So I needed like a static GIF icon because if you got like 20 search results, I don't want to have 20 JavaScript dynamic charts in there. I want an icon of what the chart would look like once you click through. But I wanted it to look exactly like the real one and not to sort of like run J3 chart to do it or something. So it turns out that I originally chose GWT because I wanted the same code that runs on the server to run in the client. And GWT got me that code. Then I found out about all this optimization stuff and how just awesome the great compiler was at making your JavaScript fast, and then I got hooked. So, um, but my experience, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest thing of going from being a server-side programmer to being a client-side programmer is the, um, you essentially get into this uh, scenario where you want to basically do database queries, like using Hibernate or, you know, JP or something like that, and you just want to send them down to the client. And, that's like one of the most common mistakes people um, do when they go from like the uh, J2 EE world to doing GWT is they take their existing code and they, they pull out like a huge Hibernate query or something like that and then they just try to send it over RPC to, to GWT. And you have to actually think more carefully about what you're sending to the browser because if you want to keep the user experience fast and light, you don't want to send like a serialize a whole object tree over. So my experience has been is that you think about what you're sending over the wire first and try to minimize what you're sending over the wire. So um, that's basically all I can say right now is, is you know, think about the client. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice for um, migrating from, I guess, the typical MVC, the U U UI people hand you the HTML, you carve it up into pieces and you go off on the server side and now it's more of the event-driven model. Did you find, like, any particular resources would help people go from, you know, the Java world that they've been in for a while that they haven't done any real GUI programming. So I, I would recommend um, looking up someone named Rob Jellinghouse on the web. He actually did a thing called, is it JSF for GWT? Or GWT for J, uh, yeah. I don't know how active the project is, but basically allows you to sort of um, program in sort of a JSF-like model, but integrate with GWT components on the client side. Um, I haven't used it, but um, Rob used to, you know, uh, wax, you know, on about it all the time. So I, I, I've heard good things about it. Maybe. Oh, yeah, Seam broke it or something. There was something where, like, some... So the, the, but the, the answer is that it's kind of broken right now. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? Um, hey. Excellent. Um, you, can, you can ask another one if you want to ask. Yeah, we have like a minute left. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you, did you see any problems when you were talking to Flash with it actually with large data sets kind of bloating up the Flash player? And secondly, do you see this being extensible in a peer-to-peer -peer data model with localized uh, gear database with the Syndroid stuff? Uh, well, the latter question, I think I don't have, I have 15 seconds to answer. That's maybe too much. But in the former question, um, yeah, you do have to watch out um, uh, uh, because implicitly when you call flash methods, you end up marshalling stuff. The data has to be marshaled as like a string or an XML format. So you got to be careful 
of sending objects. I would recommend when you're doing these RPC mechanisms to use primitive types uh, as much as possible. Uh, I think that's uh, it. I'm out of time. And um, so I'd like to say on behalf of Google, everyone, thanks for coming and um, have a great week.